this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. This time we're going to be talking again about the measurements of stars and we discussed a whole bunch of different things about stars but now we're going to actually look at something really interesting which is the sizes of stars. As you look out into the night sky you see these little points of light way up high in the sky but they belie the fact that some of them are physically larger and physically smaller than each other. So how exactly big are these stars? Well, let's go back to our HR diagram that we looked at last time. And the HR diagram has is a relationship between the luminosity and temperature of it. Is, and when you relate the luminosity and temperature, you also have a definite relationship with the radius of a star. So in the upper right-hand corner are the largest of the stars, the giants and the supergiants, and the lower left are the main are the white dwarfs. And they can range from approximately at the size of the Earth all the way up to a thousand or two thousand ten thousand times the size a thousand times the size of the sun. They can be really, really big. Stellar properties, as we discussed last time, depend on four three things: the luminosity, radius, temperature relationship that we here see here, that the luminosity or the total energy output of the star is equal to 4 pi r squared, r star squared, where r star is the radius of the star. And the 4 pi r squared is the surface area of a sphere. And then there's a sigma, uh, you multiply it by sigma, which is uh, the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, which relates the energy uh, luminosity to the uh, temperature to the fourth power. So the surface temperature of a star to the fourth power times its radius to the squared times a few constants, 4 pi sigma, gets you the luminosity of the star, the total energy output of the star. And when we look at that, we find that there's a huge range of stellar luminosities from uh, one, one one hundredth of one percent of the sun to a million times that of the sun. And there's a huge range of stellar radii from something about a one hundredth the size of the sun, which is about the size of the Earth, to about a thousand times the radius of the sun. And the, the uh, range of stellar temperatures ranges from very cool, just something under uh, 3,000 Kelvin to about 50,000 Kelvin, which is interesting to think. It only ranges over a factor of only 20 or so. And the, there's a big, pretty big range of stellar masses between about a tenth of the mass of the sun to about 50 or up to maybe on the extraordinarily rarest regions, 50 times the mass of the sun. But our concern this time is with R sub star, which is the radius of stars. When we actually go through and compare the different kinds of stars, we see that for main sequence stars, this is roughly how they go. And so the O-type stars are the physically largest stars, and the M-type stars are the physically smallest type. The masses are also greater for the O-stars than the M-stars, but really the range of mass isn't that huge, as we saw before. And, but the radius makes it look like there's a lot more stuff there. And frankly, there is because O stars are more massive than M stars. They can be up to 50 to 100 times the mass of the sun, where M stars can be like a, like a 78 to 10% of the mass of the sun or even less. We see that the range of stellar, stellar sizes on the main sequence for stars on the main sequence can range appreciably. So this range of an M star is roughly about the size of Jupiter. The G-type stars are the size of the Sun. So an O-type main sequence star is very big compared to the Sun. Let's see how we compare this. So I grabbed this off Wikipedia, which is a lot of fun, and I like this thing. So I sliced it up and had some fun with it. So we're comparing the planets, Mercury, Mar Mercury Mars, then Venus and Earth. And we see that Venus and Earth are roughly the same size. But we're going to compare it and see, let's shrink the Earth down to that. And the Earth is only is smaller than Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. Jupiter is the largest planet of the solar system. But how is Jupiter compared to the Sun? And so let's compare Jupiter to the Sun. And we see to the left, to the right of Jupiter is a is a uh, brown dwarf, red dwarf type star called Wolf 359, which is an M type dwarf in the solar neighborhood, within about 20, 15 light years of the Sun. And there's the sun right there in the middle with the orange modeling, and that comes from you know just some images that somebody downloaded and put together to make it look like the sun. But the Jupiter is a little bit smaller than that compared to the sun, but not by much. It's about 10 Jupiters fit across the sun. And the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, is an A-type star, and it's physically larger than the sun. And that star is about seven light years away, and it's a big, big star. And if you go out in the winter sky, you can see Sirius in the sky. 
Next, if we shrink down and look at how Sirius compares to other bigger stars that we're familiar with, uh, Pollux is a much, and then we're talking now red giant type stars. Pollux is to its right, which is one of the tw one of the twins in, Cas in the in the Gemini twins of Castor and Pollux. Then it's Arc to Arcturus, where if you take the handle of the Big Dipper and you arc over to the bright right red star, that's Arcturus. It's extremely large compared to the Sun. It looks like the Sun is maybe about twelve or fifteen suns fit across, so that would mean about a thousand suns would fit inside it. And if you then think of Aldebaran, Aldebaran is a huge red giant star that's in the constellation Taurus, in the, in the same direction as the Hyades. Aldebaran's not part of the Hyades, it's kind of an interloper, but it's an enormous red giant star. So now let's see if what the even larger stars are, and we go down from Aldebaran, we see, let's make that really tiny, and we have Rigel, which is one of the, star, the blue star that we see here, so that's a blue giant star, or one of the uh, blue supergiants, and that blue supergiant is in the foot of Orion in the wintertime. And then Antares is the middle star here, and that is the heart of the Scorpion and Scorpius. And Betelgeuse is the farthest right one, and Betelgeuse is the bright red star in the shoulder of Orion in the wintertime. So if we keep scooting down and say even larger stars, some of the largest stars known are Mu Cephei, Vivi Cephei, and Vy Canis Majoris. And the reason they have that strange designation is because these are variable stars. All four of these are variable, and they're enormous. In fact, Vy Canis Majoris is one of the largest stars known. And if we take a peek at how big it is, we see that Vy Canis Majoris is so large that it would insanely dwarf the sun. The sun looks like a tiny, tiny, tiny speck, or roughly the size of a small one of one of Saturn's larger moons, not Titan per se, because that's pretty big but one of Saturn's maybe smaller moons compared to the sun. It, the sun, the Vy Canis Majoris is in so insanely large, it would be much larger than Jupiter's orbit, much larger than Saturn's orbit. It's one of the largest stars known. So this is another red supergiant star. And clearly Vy Canis Majoris at some point will stop doing what it's doing and do something else called supernova. We'll talk about that later though. So now if we move along, and then we see on the other side of the spectrum, the white dwarfs, which we said, oh, they're all the way down there and that. This is the typical size of a white dwarf. So white dwarfs are about the same size as the Earth. They're roughly the same mass as the Sun. So they're much, much, much more dense than the Earth. We demonstrate here that the escape velocity is about 2% the speed of light, which really is much, much, much faster than the escaping from the surface of the Earth. And if we then compare it to someplace in the sky, that one of that we know that in the sky is Sirius B, which is the white dwarf orbit in, in a co-orbit with Sirius A, the brightest star in the sky. So not only is Sirius the brightest star in the sky, and one of the closest stars, and an important A-type star, it's also a binary star, as we saw before, and one and its companion is a white dwarf. And the white dwarf can actually be seen in a small telescope, and this comes from the Hubble Space Telescope when they're trying to determine the mass utilizing of, of Sirius B, utilizing the fact that a, some, if it's got 2% the speed of light for an escape velocity, then it should have a significant gravitational redshift to the spectral lines coming off it. And so this is part of that study. So stellar radii in general are extremely difficult to measure directly because they're really far away. So if you're about a parsec away, the sun will be less than 1%, 1% of an arc second. That's really small. And remember, an arc second is the same as a football at edge on 37 miles away. So then you'd have to take it even farther, a thousand times further away in order to get, or a hundred times in this case. So that's a really, really, really small thing to see. And I, you probably couldn't see it. So stars, are apparently small because they're so far away, but they're not actually small. They're not physically small. They just appear small because of the angular size, because they're so far away. And so in order to see them, you can use interferometry, which uh, allows you, which says that you can say on single stars, you have some sort of large baseline and you try to measure the size of with respect to background stars. Then you can have lunar occultation. So if the moon passes in front of the star, then the star will dim. And as it dims, that belies its size. So if it dims rapidly, it's small. If it dims slowly, it's big. And then if you have an eclipsing binary, you still need the distance to the star, but the eclipsing binary definitively shows the size. 
And occasionally, the stars are big enough and close enough that you can actually directly image them, such as Betelgeuse. And so not very many stars have had their sizes, their direct sizes, their radii measured. But let's take a look, for example, at, at uh, Betelgeuse, an example. And this is from Ta uh, Baba Tafrishi from um, theworldatnight.org. And uh, it's also when he, he likes going to the European Southern Observatory and taking some amazing photographs of the southern sky. And we see right off on the right-hand telescope there, just above, that, uh, the, above it and to the left is a reddish star. And that reddish star, I'll mark it with my, my mouse, and the reddish star is Betelgeuse. And if it looks kind of weird to you, it's because it's in, this, in the southern hemisphere. So Orion's upside down when seen from Chile. So that's kind of interesting. So this is from the European Southern Observatory, taken by Babak de Frischi. Anyway, Betelgeuse is a great example of what we're going to be talking about. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star in the upper right-hand corner of the HR diagram. And it is a bright red star, and it is a star that's bright at red, it's red because it's bright at red wavelengths. And this is a typical spectrum for an M-type star. Um, and let's see, because therefore it's bright, brighter in the red, so they'll appear red in the sky. So it's an M-type star, and we then see because we know it's a supergiant, because remember that the difference in, when we looked at luminosity classes, that a main sequence M dwarf type star will be compact. And since it's compact, the atoms and molecules hit each other and are moving quicker and they're under greater pressure. And if they're under greater pressure, they can absorb and emit light at slightly different frequencies than the atomic frequency that would normally be emitted or absorbed at that wavelength. Say hydrogen could absorb not just at 6563 angstroms, but maybe 6566 and down to 6550 angstroms. So that would be something where you'd see for a dwarf star. But in a supergiant star, there's almost no pressure because it's all very feathery and gossamer in the outer regions. So there's almost no pressure. So there's no pressure broadening because the atoms and molecules aren't moving as fast. So you don't get as much broadening. I think a Doppler broadening, but that's a different thing. All right. So Betelgeuse is really big, and that's how we know it's really big is because of the luminosity class inside of its spectra. But it actually, its size can actually be measured. And Anthony Dupre and uh, Mr. D Dr. Dupre at uh, C Center for Astrophysics back in 95 actually measured the size of the star. And we see that it's much bigger than Earth's orbit. And you can see that it actually doesn't have a spherical appearance. So it's kind of a weird looking star. And in fact, the, uh, a group of people at the European Southern Observatory took a long, adapt a long image of it, and this was from the VLT, or Very Large Telescope in Chile, and they used some adaptive optics and found that they're, and they were able to get resolution using this adaptive optics down to milli arc seconds. And so that's a, it's a really tricky thing to see, but they were able to do so in the near infrared so that they can actually have higher resolution. So then they took that, we're going to take the image that we saw previously, and we see how it compares to the image that was taken with a very large telescope by this group. And then if we then pull out even further, we see that actually even larger than that, and this is by Curvella and group at the you're using the VLT, we see that the previous image is actually compacted inside of a much larger image. That is a huge, huge, huge area of extended glow and emission around the star. And this star is actually much less of a spherical distribution than waves of stuff coming out. We're going to see that this contributes to the star being highly variable. And even and because it's a variable star, it's an interesting thing to watch. And one day this star may explode as a supernova and those clouds around it that are, that are coming off of Betelgeuse. And each red ring that I've shown you previously is the previous image inside of the other one. And all of this stuff comes from Curvella's group at European Southern Observatory taken by the Very Large Telescope. This is an artist impression of what it might look like. And so you can pretty much think that this is an enormous catastrophic lava lamp in the sky. And when we look at huge, huge, huge stars like this, they tend not to be spherical in their distribution, but that's exactly what they do look like. They're enormous, enormous objects in the sky. And, uh, and what's interesting is Betelgeuse is a good star to learn variable star, naked eye or telescope or, uh, or small telescope or even photographic observations with because it varies randomly because of its puffy outer shape. So 
one day super, it might go supernova, and we'll talk about that pretty soon. So, see you next time.